So as we, you may be aware that industrial harmony is very, very important in an institution. And of course, ensuring that we, we keep um, uh, peace in our institution and ensuring that each and every employee I think is taken care of in the manner it's supposed to be done. The reason why uh, within the Institute, we have gurus uh, of uh, our practice. Mr. Rari Stanford Anakoma is a fellow of the Zambia Institute of Human Resource Management, who is an HR human resource uh, expert. And his area of expert is uh, of course in trying to advocate for industrial and personal harmony in institutions. Uh, to this effect, I think uh, without wasting much of your time, and uh, as I am also apologizing for starting the meeting about uh, 10 minutes uh, late than the time which we, 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 we allocated, which is uh, 15, uh, 15.30. The president has, uh, along the way is going to join us who will be given also time maybe to speak to, uh, to us uh, at a given time. But uh, as uh, we, we know the fact that uh, time is not with us, may I take this rare opportunity as I in invite one of among the gurus in, uh, in HR uh, as an advocate for industrial and occupation harmony, one and the only one, Mr. Rabi Stanford, Anakoma to speak to us. Mr. Anakoma, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, fellow practitioners. It's indeed uh, a, a great opportunity for me to, to share uh, a few points with regards to the topic that has uh, been uh, uh, put before us. Uh, this is a discussion uh, I also wish to, to learn. I take it that uh, I will be leading the discussion myself in that I'm just bringing a few points. And then as we interact, I should be able to pick something. I should be able to learn something from your own experiences. And in that regard, I, I wish to encourage everyone to open up as we'll be discussing and if there are any questions that are relating to this topic, we should be able to have them and look at, at them as practitioners so that we, we, we share our notes on this. Now, indeed, we are, uh, we are a bit late. We have started a, a, uh, later than anticipated. The topic which we are looking at, is, it's in form of a question. Can an employer replace the charging officer and constitute the disciplinary committee during ongoing disciplinary inquiries. This is what we'll be discussing uh, this afternoon, fellow practitioners. Now, we need to begin by unpackaging our question. So I've, uh, I've come up with uh, a few pointers. We'll look at the background to disciplinary hearing processes. Then we'll look at the source of disciplinary powers. Uh, in our our day-to-day -day operations, then the disciplinary code and employment procedures. Then we look at uh, the rules that regulate uh, disciplinary actions, and there are there any exceptions to that. And then we start looking at how these rules relate to our policy reviews, and then we look at a few recommendations, uh, one or two, and then we we'll look at uh, we we'll conclude, and then we we'll look at as HR practitioners in order to help us understand the topic at hand. Now the background colleagues, it's what we actually do on a day to day. Disciplinary process, we are saying, this is an action which is taken by the employer, the disciplinary action. It's, it's one action which is taken by the employer. When we have noted or we have observed or it has been reported that an employee behavior or conduct does not conform to the expected behavior. That behavior which we have prescribed ourselves in our disciplinary process, ideally, 
the charging officer must be the immediate supervisor who should raise the charges depending on the procedures that we have in our institutions the charging officer will raise the, the charge uh, the, the, the charge in certain institutions that is uh, preceded by a show cause letter in others they just can go others have got a mix where certain offenses have uh, decided that no these offenses where well, we don't even need a show cause letter is just direct we raise a charge a charge in most institutions is submitted to hr HR who looks at the, the composition of the committee, either already prescribed in the, in, the, in, the, in the disciplinary code or it is uh, constituted at that time. And it's expected that the, the people who sit in the committee are people who are not interested in the case so that we afford a fair hearing. And then the process is going through the employee can, can be brought uh, before the hearing uh, committee with the representation and the processes are supposed to be fair and the verdict is given out to the employee and then there should be a, a procedure to, to appeal in an event that the employee is not satisfied with the, the outcome of the disciplinary hearing. That's to do with the process. Now, within the process, this process is supposed to be provided for in the disciplinary court. So the disciplinary court should give the powers to a charging officer. It should outline what powers do they have? What role does HR play? What powers do, do, they, do the committee, her committee members have as they sit? And then that's why we need to appreciate the process. So the process is very critical colleagues as we have in our, in our institutions. In some institutions may not have a well-established um, uh, procedures uh, to do with uh, handling disciplinary uh, uh, processes. In that instance, there are common, uh, there are good practices, common law uh, standards that are set out that would ensure that we are seen to be much uh, on the side of pro uh, promoting fairness in the workplaces. Now we want to look at the source of disciplinary powers. The powers I've mentioned that whoever takes the disciplinary action should know where they are drawing their powers. Even the person who goes to sit to hear a case, you must review and ascertain where do I draw my powers. Others could be consultants among us ourselves. They are consultants that are specialized in disciplinary hearings. They are good at hearing disciplinary he uh, cases. They can go, you can be invited to go and sit. But the first thing that you are, you are implored to do is go and ask the internal people that you are going to find, can I have access to your procedures? Can I look at your processes? So that when you sit down to hear the case, you should know that you've got a mandate. You might be sitting in a company which has got a process which says an external person is not allowed to sit and hear an internal case. Those are situations that are there. So a simple example is that uh, or instruction or guide or advice that we need to identify where we get the mandate for whatever we are doing. Be it internally, when you are sitting down, you have been invited to hear a case, be it an appeal, go and check what are the rules regulating the appeal procedure. Now, there are two basic um, sources of um, disciplinary powers. One, it is the disciplinary code or the employment procedures, which we have in our employment, uh, in our workplaces. Most of the employers might have disciplinary code. Those who do not have, they are also encouraged to have because it's a statutory requirement. Now that disciplinary uh, procedure should be clear enough to outline the powers that we have explained and you've understood the importance. The second source are statutory disciplinary provisions. Amongst the, the employees we have in our workplaces, in some institutions, these are institutions that are created under the act. And then their removal from the offices, how we need to handle their misconduct is provided for in the, in the, in, in the relevant law, which uh, provides for the creation of uh, uh, that uh, provision. So in that instance, we may not just rely on the disciplinary code or the employment procedures. We may also need, we are also required to take a, a further step and review what are the statutory disciplinary uh, provisions that are there. 
Now, why I've brought out this aspect is that the question that we have at hand, it can be handled differently depending on whether the charging officer and the committee in question is provided for either under the disciplinary court, which was created, which is the creation of an institution, or the charging officer has got the powers and the disciplinary provision. The two would be a question on whether we can replace the disciplinary hearing committee. So we move now. Our main interest right now is the disciplinary code and employment procedures. The answer for both under for sources of the powers, whether the charging officer draws the powers under the disciplinary code or a statutory provision, the clear answer is that you are not mandated to replace the charging officer or reconstitute the disciplinary co hearing committee. This is a general rule. Now, why do we need to have these provisions? The rules, the, uh, the statutory provisions, these are a best disciplinary committee had the necessary powers, and if such powers were properly exercised. Whenever there's an argument as to whether the actions were appropriately taken, the question is, did we have any powers provided for, and did we exercise those powers appropriate, properly? You can only ascertain that if you have either a disciplinary court or statutory disciplinary procedures. And you can only know when you are called upon to take such actions, if you take time to review. Now, I already indicated the general response, the general rule regretting replacement of charging officers is that you cannot replace because the person is accountable to their immediate supervisor. So generally speaking, speaking, I should only be charged or questioned of what I've done by my immediate supervisor. And if there's a provision in the disciplinary code of the composition of a disciplinary, uh, disciplinary hearing, that is the committee which is supposed to sit and hear my case. Should we depart from those provisions, we are creating a wrongful decision. If there's any dismissal, that results into a wrongful dismissal because we have disregarded our own rules, which we had set out as an institution in our disciplinary uh, procedure rules. So we have changed either the charging officer or who substituted the committee members. However, for the committee or a charging officer who has been given the powers under a disciplinary code, there are exceptions to when we can replace or reconstitute a disciplinary hearing. But it must be taken seriously and considered that for those whose procedures to handle disciplinary hearings are prescribed under the law, statutory bodies, where it indicates, be it the, it's a CEO, that a CEO can only be removed from the office when ABCD has been satisfied or when a particular office has taken action. We cannot replace such a person. If we cannot replace such a person who needs to take action, even if there was need to take action by ourselves or, or just to meet the, the, the requirements or the circumstances at that, at that moment. Now I indicated for provisions that relate to the disciplinary hearing, we have a way of deviating, departing from what we had prescribed. We have this employee Stanford who reports to Mr. Kolala and it 
it has been established that Mr. Kolara cannot take disciplinary action. The company can replace Mr. Kolara by another person. Now, what are those scenarios that would give rise or exceptions for us to depart from the general rule? We should keep in mind that the general rule is that you cannot replace unless if you satisfy two basic conditions. It will be reasonable and justified if these conditions are satisfied. One, where the circumstances of the case indicate that you can't practically adhere to the disciplinary code. Now, let's look at scenarios that would uh, give rise to such. I gave an example of Mr. Kolala being my immediate supervisor. And it has been established that the, the offense that Stanford needs to be uh, charged uh, for, even Mr. Kolala is involved. How possible is it that we can allow Mr. Kolala to continue to raise a charge when he's jointly uh, uh, in breach of a particular offense? How do we allow a person who's been seen to be uh, conflicted from the beginning in the, in the case to continue to, to, to raise the charge? How do we continue to allow people who are sitting uh, in the disciplinary committee when we have established that these people are conflicted and the outcome will not be fair, not only fair to the institution, fair even to the person that we are hearing. Remember the rules that we need to uphold throughout, and that's a second condition. This disciplinary hearing aims at the promotion of the principles of natural justice. And the, the basic uh, guidelines to do with the principles of natural justice that the person must be given a fair hearing. That's the charged employee. The fair, the fair hearing entails that the people who are complainants cannot make a decision or cannot hear. Therefore, a person must be heard by an impartial tribunal. People who are not interested in the case, people who are not offended by what is being complained about. Those are people who need to sit. Now, as an institution, as an HR practitioner, when a case is brought before you, you review the people who are sitting in the disciplinary hearing and you find that somebody is conflicted, then you will be justified and it will be reasonable for you to go ahead and replace a person sitting in the committee or even go ahead to reconstitute a disciplinary hearing committee because the people who are sitting there, you found that they are the ones, they can't actually hear a case. Now let's go back to the case of Mr. Kolar. If Mr. Kolar is my immediate supervisor and then he needs to raise a charge, but a disciplinary hearing indicates that Mr. Kolar, being the, the, the honorary secretary for Zirim, he's the one who is supposed to hear the appeals. And then the case on appeal is supposed to go to him, but he already raised the, uh, uh, a charge. Because we don't want to involve a person who is already interested, automatically, he's not going to hear the case when it gets to him. In some instances, we've prescribed persons who are supposed to sit in disciplinary hearings, but we haven't provided for the rules what will happen to their immediate subordinates because the, 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 the rules of a game are going to change. All along, we are, we are saying this person is going to, to chair the disciplinary hearing involving people from other departments. Now, time has come where their immediate subordinate has been charged, and that is the person who has charged. At that moment, the immediate supervisor has become interested in the case and will not give us a fair hearing if we allow that person to continue sitting in the disciplinary hearing committee. Even if the procedure indicates that Mr. Kolara will sit in all the cases, but because it involves a case of Stanford, whom, who is the immediate subordinate and upon whom he raised the charge, we are going to replace him. That's a, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a case on, on, on that issue. Now, these are issues that are happening in our workplaces, colleagues. 
Now, there are scenarios that we may not have uh, foreseen and they just happen like this one where an employee says, no, no, this person cannot sit in the hearing and we're going to do this. It, it, it's, it's not something that would be easily understood and accepted by employees, and I can assure you, it's not very easy to understand and accept. And in some instances, these are some of the disputes that are out there. If you want to do such a thing, or we've gotten to a point where we need to do such a thing, we want to depart from what is provided for in our disciplinary hearing, we need to take certain steps to ensure that everyone who is involved, the stakeholders are aware. Where you've got a union, inform them of the challenge of proceeding with it, the current status in the disciplinary court. Let the employee be informed of what, what are the repercussions of proceeding with it, what is provided for in the disciplinary court. And everyone should understand that we are departing from this provision. However, we should not leave it that is a standard that we are going just going to be departing. It is a best practice that right now we start checking or start reviewing or we consider our disciplinary codes when we are formulating that suppose this scenario had occurred, what are we going to do? It is best for us as practitioners to have all the scenarios that we can foresee in our institutions, those that we can foresee provided for. And once they are provided for, at that particular time, there would not be a major departure. What we want to avoid is having an unnecessary dispute that needs to be resolved and productive engagements with employees or having to go and start explaining before the courts of law. Us wanting to go and win the cases when you go to the courts of law, I've always mentioned in my discussion that our battle as HR practitioners is not before the courts of law. Our battle is just within our offices that our employees understand our processes, that we simplify our processes, that they, once they have understood, they do not even proceed to take out any legal action against the employer. So one of the recommendations that I'm taking, one of the uh, uh, steps that I'm recommending right now is that how soon, or it's a question, how soon, or how often, how soon do you think you are going to to review your, your, your disciplinary rules. Have you interacted with your colleagues? I, 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 was, I was very happy when I saw that uh, the networking uh, event which was there, when I saw somebody giving a testimony of how they interacted. When we are interacting, what have we learned about our, the scenarios that our colleagues have uh, gone through? And then we have questions. Suppose this had happened in our institution, how much prepared are we? We have seen questions being posted in, 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 our, in our groups. We have seen questions that are coming from our colleagues. When we read and when we take them home, we take them into our institutions. The question is, how much ready, how, am I ready right now to handle such a scenario, be it from the practice point of view or from the procedural aspect? If your procedures are, cannot support you to do that, I'm encouraging that this is a time that you can sit down and start to, to review so that you have a basis in, for, for, for you to take out any actions. Now, make reasonable projections and formulate and revise the disciplinary action. I move to the, I would say the last part before we move into our discussions. These exemptions that I've shared should not provide an avenue for employers to deliberately interfere with disciplinary actions, including those that have been correctly, procedurally initiated. Because we are going to be caught up. Does not, these exemptions do not apply in all the circumstances. You need to sit down and look at the circumstances surrounding that particular case in order for you to say, now I want to deviate. I want to replace the charging officer 
you don't replace a charging officer because you're not even you you just differed with the charging officer say no i'm not going to allow him to take any action in some institutions sitting on disciplinary uh, hearing committees there's an allowance and then you just say no because me i don't want this person to have an allowance i'm going to be replacing this person you see you will not sit on any committee i'm the one who is uh, appointing people so i'm going to remove you from the committee those are not the grounds we are going to use colleagues the grounds are supposed to be reasonable and justified and should be in line with the promotion of the principles of natural justice the circumstances are limited when we can interfere with a live disciplinary committee and that's only if those measures are necessary to uphold the principles of natural justice providing for a fair hearing it's not where you feel the committee which is there it might have a verdict which is different from what i've already indicated to management i told them this person is going but they already have started questioning me these people the outcome may not favor us we are not going to change the disciplinary committee because of those reasons those reasons are not justified you have a preconceived outcome and you feel the committee is not going to give you that and you feel the members are supposed to be replaced that is not going to happen and that's the conclusion that i have or i'm making that's the end of my presentation with regards to the substantive presentation before we go into looking at the questions recommended reading if we want to appreciate the procedures the powers and the processes i'm encouraging the hr practitioners to cultivate a culture of also reading in depth all the literature that is going to help us so that we have the mandate we have the powers whatever decision we are taking we even know where we are standing so i've, I've gotten uh, four cases that would uh, help us to understand issues to do with the identification of charging officers the disciplinary process says the disciplinary committee and how we need to exercise the powers that are outlined in the disciplinary uh, code the cases i will share with the uh, secretariat for 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 the app for the for the sharing of the members but those who are able to take down the first case is super bet sports betting versus batuke kalimukwa this is a supreme court a case of 2016 super bets sports betting versus vatuke kalimukwa then the second one you've got zambia electricity supply corporation which is zesco versus david rubas muyambango then we have the case involving the the, the attorney general versus richard jackson piri and you've got the most recent case for 2021 involving occupational health and safety institute and luwinda chainda this is for 2021 i open the floor for questions that is the end of my presentation i now want to learn more from you and then we interact thank you so much the host to help us with uh, the the questions we can now interact mr mlenga uh mr uh, mlenga uh, kolala i i don't know how we have the questions Yes, good afternoon, fellow uh, practitioners. Uh, my good, uh, my good colleague Hanakoma. Congratulations, that was a good presentation. I believe we have taken one or two issues as the uh, practitioners because we know such are some of the things which have been crippling on us. Just, just uh, to recognize the vice president who is of the institute who is amongst us, Mr. Clement Chipungu as well as the, the councillor Helen Mwanga Piri, 
and Olive Ann Nunque, uh, you are most welcome, uh, fellow uh, councillors. So how we are going to proceed uh, is that we will be asking the fellow practitioners, those who have questions, uh, then they will be asked, they'll ask questions. Maybe we'll take three uh, in a row, then Mr. Hanakoma is going to, to answer. So I'll be, uh, I'll be giving now that chance and the privilege to our colleague. I think the first one is Mr. Trust, Danny. Um, yes. Mr. Hangwamuna. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to to pick the, the speaker. I, I don't know if uh, I'm the only one. Uh, I think we are we are working on on the um, the technical side. Is I think is from the technical side. Uh, in the interest of time, is it okay if I proceeded with the, the meeting in our chat? Are we good to go now, uh, Mr. Angwamuna? Brother Xavier, Z Z this is Joy. Are we good to go? Mr. Nombi. Brother Dan, Mr. Numa, are you there? Hello? Hello? Mr. Numbi, uh, I think we have about uh, six colleagues who wishes to ask the questions or contribute. But I think the system is failing us uh, from this end. Okay, Mr. Mrenga, at, uh, at the proposal that maybe I could also address the questions that have been submitted in our chat. What is we are resolving the 
the challenge. Is that fine? I think that is the best way. In the meantime, we can go by that. And maybe let me encourage okay. the other, the other members maybe to take advantage of the questions through the chat as we are trying to resolve i think the the, 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 the technical challenge uh mr anakoma you can go ahead sir okay yes thank you sir uh, uh we have the the first question uh, has been submitted by madam alice chavateni uh the question says, under the Industrial Relations Act Cap 269, provides that no external forces shall dictate disciplinary action. Then the question now, I think that was a statement like a preamble. Then now she submits, can you engage a consultant when you are still handling it administratively? Uh, colleagues, uh, one, my understanding on the on external forces not dictating, it means that you do not push for a particular outcome in a disciplinary hearing. However, moving to the question that she has asked, how can we use consultants? Consultants can be used if, one, your procedure ad, uh, provides for the use of consultants in disciplinary hearing. If your disciplinary rules, disciplinary procedures needs the use of external persons other than those employed by the company. The employee who is charged has got a right to question in that disciplinary hearing. Then, how do you use the consultant if there is need you provide for the same or if you've gotten to a point where you satisfy the requirements that i've outlined that it's not practical for, for you to use the people within the institute in order to promote the rules of then the the second question i don't know if that was uh, sufficiently attended to i would uh, request the the owner of the question madam chabaten in an event is not satisfactory you can still write down we are here to interact and we can still uh, uh, look at it but generally speaking we do not allow external forces in this regard may not only mean consultants, anyone who is not part of the disciplinary hearing. The consultants can only come to hear the cases if they are provided for in the disciplinary hearing by the rules in an event they are not provided for because it's not tenable for us to use the people from within the institution. In that case, let us bring out the benefits of using the consultant today people who are involved, let a charged employee be informed to your own benefit. We want to get an independent aid. However, all this cannot happen if you are using statutory disciplinary procedures, unless that's when we can do all these deviations. The next question has come from, uh, I, I presume this, this is Madam Flavia Musonda. This is, uh, the question is what happens in the event of a stand, standing committee prescribed by the disciplinary code being conflicted? Can the company constitute another committee? If they are conflicted, it meets the rules for us to depart from the general rule of not replacing. And you can read the case for uh occupational health which i've shared that's what ex those were prescribed were conflicted and then they felt that it, it was not practical for them to proceed with that hearing though they didn't share the the details with the employee and he was conflicted he was uh 
that went Mr. Hanakoma, I think we are unable to, to get you. Maybe others are, and but I think you are breaking. There was a determination in, in that. Us, we don't just take action. They see that they move together with us. They understand what is us attending. Now we have a string of, yes, sir. If you are able to get me. Yes, I think now we are. Can we? Okay, the, the next question uh, uh, from an anonymous attendee say, how do you handle a case where the accused is reporting directly to the CEO who is the, the final hearing officer? These are situations, colleagues, I said we need to foresee now and provide for in our disciplinary uh, Institutions that have got uh, an independent board actually have opted to indicate that those employees who report direct to the CEO, when they are charged by the CEO, because the CEO cannot hear the case again, they've provided that the board is the one which is going to hear the case, and they've split the board members on the, 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 the initial hearing and the appeal procedure. However, for institutions that do not have an established board, this is a time that you can make use of these consultants that we are mentioning and the external people that you may feel are, are, are relevant. There are other institutions like Zirim provide those and we've got even private uh, consultants who do such hearings. You may have to provide for in your, in your disciplinary rules that for those who direct report to the CEO when the charges are raised, this is how we are going to proceed and you decide on which the method that best suits yourselves. But again, I'm encouraging you do not try to human resources. Maybe at that moment you want to engage them, they are not available to assist you, then you'll be tied. It's better I just indicate that for those, we can constitute a committee or HR will be empowered or a CEO can engage uh, a corporate body or a consultant external of, uh, of the members from within to hear the cases and be clear to also prescribe the roles each of those people that are going to come and the numbers that you you require in some instances people have gotten to a point where they can we go back to to, to the internal members and then an employee challenges that you know this person is conflicted and cannot actually take the minutes so we need to check to what extent internal members are conflicted and how we intend to resolve them uh, the next uh, uh, the questions are moving sometimes i this one is uh okay uh I will provide the Kumbi, uh, who is going to update our, our group on the cases that are, uh, uh, which have been shared. This was Mr. Eras Kasongo, who indicated, thank you, so we proceed with uh, questions in the chat. Mr. Nakoma, I think you are breaking and uh, sadly we can't get you. Yes, you are breaking, sir. Mr. Stephen Skombe, my older brother, he says point, I think now he's able to, are you able to get me? Okay, no. uh, if you are able to get me, I was just getting, and I think those who've managed to, are you able to get me? Oh, we are still... I think we are having a bit of a challenge in terms of, uh, from that other side. Okay, are you able to get me? Now, uh, loud and clear there. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what's the tenure of a disciplinary hearing committee? 
the same person has asked an expatriate employee be a chairperson for a disciplinary hearing committee. We need to prescribe all these. There is no standard uh, tenure for a disciplinary hearing, but a period for hearing the case should be reasonable. Reasonable in that if there's no investigations required, we won't understand why we should take months to dispose of the case. Then in an event that the question is also referring to the lifespan of a committee in some companies, the committees are standing committees provided for in there for offices. So they can be there for talking about the active or live disciplinary hearing committee, the process should not take for life. We should uh, quickly conclude the cases as, from, as, as close as, uh, as, as, as soon as we, can, uh, as we can manage. Can I next? But employee be a chairperson for a disciplinary hearing committee, one in the disciplinary code and what is the expertise of that particular person. There's no rule that excludes a person in just because maybe they are expatriate employees. We need to ascertain the level of the understanding of our practices in Zambia. The level of understanding, the basic understanding of procedures. If you've trained them in general and they are well appreciate there's nothing wrong to use an expatriate to be a member or to chair a disciplinary hearing. The next question, I don't know if I'm still there, Mr. Mulenga. Uh, Indeed, you are still there. Though, of course, you are, though, of course, you are, you are yes, you are still there, but you are breaking, sorry? you are breaking in most cases. We are still. Okay. 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 Sorry about that. I, I I don't know the challenge that I could be having. The next question is how do you handle a case that has both administrative process or a criminal aspect or both? That uh, we have another discussion on how to handle, but a clear response is that it is best to deal with in administrative cases before you proceed to report a criminal aspect in the case. Why do I say criminal matter is going to take? So if you want to wait, you're going to keep an employee on your records, assuming that this case can result into, disciplinary process, into, into a dismissal um, of a criminal proceeding, you are the place at which they'll be doing things. So you are going to separate the two. The rules are different. The standard of proof is different. The people that are involved are different. The only time you are going to wait for the hour you would want to push the criminal case ahead of my to want in an administrative process is deeply connected with a criminal case which you cannot isolate in the investigation. Then in that case, you might have wait to get the information but if you can get the information internally on the administrative breaches remember administrative rules 
criminal rule, uh, criminal the procedures. It's a test again in the penal code. What is what does this particular employee breach the disciplinary process? And view? this is another topic that we can venture venture into. But briefly, this is what this is the shortest uh, feedback I can give. That start with internal processes, proceed with criminal. If you are not able to investigate independent internal, then you may have to wait. And then there are cases, those who are interested, I can share some cases where the reliance on the evidence that arises from a criminal offense, criminal proceeding have been used in the disciplinary processes. We have no access, just read the questions in this chat. That's uh, another uh, comment that is coming uh, uh, from the other end. Then the next question, can the case of theft by an employee be taken to police? And if he's arrested by police, can we put such an employee on suspension? Kindly advise. Suspension is provided for in the employment code. If I'm not mistaken, that should be section 40. The provision in the employment code says, we shall suspend an employee as outlined in the disciplinary rules. Whether an employee who has been taken to the police and in police custody for safety, the suspension should be regulated by our internal rules what have we prescribed? If we haven't prescribed, the general rule on suspension is that we want to suspend an employee who has committed either a fundamental a breach of a disciplinary, a, a fundamental a breach to the disciplinary rules, or the presence of an employee who affect the investigations that are going on, or it will affect the, the, the continuous, the smooth op continuous operation if you do not have disciplinary rules outlining what would warrant a suspension, a good practice will be based on those things that I've mentioned. You need to check. The presence, you cannot continue operating with the way you are mentioning, for instance, you are talking of a theft. This person can beat anyone, including the CEO, and you can only be this person can only be separated when you bring the police. Just suspend the person when they are outside uh, of the police custard because you are scared that tomorrow they might even beat off the HR director and sign a new contract or force you to sign a new contract for them and give themselves their rights. Okay, the other one is coming from Mr. Mutinta Mukonde, sorry, I can't say uh, Mr. this name. You start with questions in chat now, okay? Can you repeat what, I don't know at what point uh, I'll need guidance. And sorry, I'm seeing some more messages that I'm uh, breaking. Uh, sorry, I don't know if I need to be uh, reminded whenever I'm, I'm not uh, audible. Mr. Eras Kasongo says, what steps and considerations are in place to ensure fairness and consistency in the application of disciplinary actions across all employees, regardless of their uh, position or department, and how is this achieved? Firstly, your employees must understand the rules that you have. Secondly, they should know their rights. Third, there should be a commitment from management that you want to adhere to the rules and respect the employees' rights. Whatever we are going to do, the disciplinary actions we'll be doing, we must be aware of the rules we must follow and the rights that must be respected, which each employee at each level, from the lowest up to the highest, that those rules are supposed to be upheld. It's interesting, colleagues, that actually sometimes we think the most vulnerable are on the lower end. Our superiors, they could be CEOs, directors, they may not even have time to review these things. They also need protection. So it's us to sit down at this is what is supposed to be done, and we orient them. So the best way we can achieve this, can we make everyone aware of the provisions of our policies? 
Can we have policies that can be understood by employees? Can we have regular interactions with employees? Can we encourage fairness? This from everyone, we are going to have consistency in the application of disciplinary actions, and we are going to have fairness. Fair And fairness. Mr. Hanakoma, I think you, we are not getting. I think it relates to natural brain. justice. It also connects to the board. You say I'm conflicted in this case. Fair hearing, having a fair hearing also in terms. And that's why we are saying, can you have the internal capacity? Let it come out in your training. We are going to rely on him external. Okay. Um, maybe we may mute. I have noted at, at some point when there's a bit of interruption the other end, we may not be able to, to progress well. I was on the question that was asked by Mr. Elias Kasongo on how we can ensure fairness and consistency in the application of disciplinary actions across all employees, regardless of their position or department. My submission was we must ensure that there's commitment from management to respect the rules, disciplinary rules, identification, and that in whatever we are doing, we are aiming at preserving that, that we know the, the rules that we've set for ourselves, and we know the rights employees have at each part, at each stage. And that the people who are hearing the cases are not interested, and that they are well acquainted with the processes and the rules of the company, the rules, the disciplinary rules. And that where you do not have internal capacity, relax your disciplinary rules to provide for use of external consultants who are specialized and they know how to go about these processes. That's we can achieve fairness and consistency in an institution. Under, how do you handle organization continues to save jurors even when he of the disciplinary committee? And we are requesting if such a procedure permanent member and they are conflicting a charging officer and a member even if the disciplinary rules of natural justice do not allow, you cannot hear the case where you are interested. You are already offended. Why you took action, you've already taken a stand, something wrong has been done. And the person will be going to just prove that position. Such a person must be spoken to, or you need to expose them to further training to guide them on what's supposed to be done when we are handling disciplinary procedures. If you are the person who is in charge of disciplinary processes as an HR person, bring it to the attention of management that this conflict is not fair and the outcome of such deliberations can be challenged and most likely they will be successive against the institution. Trust Simuyuni has the, has, the, has the question, in an event that a breach of the code of conduct is quoted by a person who is not a direct supervisor of the erring employee. Then the report is taken to the direct supervisor who is not agreeable to proceed with the charge. Who would you advise to charge, especially when the breach is clear? These are issues that we are being faced colleagues. This also points to the training that we need to have with the charging officers. Cases of disciplinary net, you've observed the breach yourself, 
or it has been reported. And when it's reported or you've observed, the test is against the state rules in an institution. It's not about what somebody has said. So it is it's clear the way Mr. Simuyuni has put it that he, it is another person who take take action, disciplinary action. When it's clear, they are also charged for not taking the the, the law of instructions from the institution. But to answer the charge, you can appoint another person, immediate supervisor, to the supervisor who. Are, when we are replacing the charging officers, we don't need to move step by step. Me, I'm reporting to Mr. If Mr. Kolada says I can't raise it. To come in from another department who, in this case now, raise the charge in this line. That's a that's the best practice that we can have. Then says who appoints the charging officer? This is from Joy Savia. The appointment of charging officer depends on what you've prescribed in your procedures. There's a, there's no standard rule. Charging officers are coming from the the, what you've prescribed in your in your disciplinary rules, and then the immediate supervisor should ideally be the ones that are raising charges. But I've said your disciplinary procedures because in certain institutions, certain levels of employees are not permitted to take disciplinary actions. So it can be reporting somebody who does not have the powers. So the disciplinary rules will indicate. Employees in this case, any breach or any need to raise a charge, the charge can only be raised, maybe starting from the supervisor in this grade, going upwards. So it's better that you are clear. But ideally, we can use a media supervisor, but it's best that you prescribe because certain levels may not have the, the, the powers or the understanding on how to raise this. action is a uh, people that are not in management usually they are maybe somebody's union imagine going to ask the, the chairperson, chairperson of the be conflicted and they feel like no this is a person i need to come and represent represent it to analyze depending on the the structural arrangement of your institution can you have the Legal officer attend a disciplinary hearing. This is from uh, Said Mutonga. Yes, and in that case, it's better. These are people. Eat either task to chair appeals hearing or we need to a committee. There's nothing wrong having in a disciplinary hearing. I would want to hear from if there's any, anything that uh, disciplinary hearing. No, this is a question from uh, Madam Doris Simwapenga. It's not every charge that should amount to disciplinary hearing. Some of the offenses are so minor that they can be resolved so as HR practitioners, at times you will see their charging officers who are quick, they'll raise a charge and bring it to, to, your, to yourselves. When you look at it, you need to look at one, what you've provided, the powers that each level have, would have. Now, it will save you time and the energy. When you are reviewing your disciplinary code, you give certain powers to certain levels of managers, certain levels of uh, persons in the department or in, during in your business. That's for minor offenses. We can handle them unless 
they are, are repeating uh, offenders. You know, you see it's late coming, somebody's charged, and then you come back and say, you know, This will require just cancelling. Find out the say, okay, the first instance, you need to cancel a person. It, you can still send it back to, to, to the person. But in some means raised, there shall be a hearing. But really to sit down and every time to hear, you need to look at the nature of getting some of these roles other than just bringing the disciplinary committee to sit. Remember, you are drawing people from uh, members and it might be taking a lot of your time. Ezekiel Moyo says, can a disciplinary committee dismiss an employee without the knowledge of the head of the institution? This one, it's very difficult to say yes or no. It's de dependent on what we have provided for in our have. So we need to look at the powers that we've uh, given to particular individuals. So, okay, the disciplinary committee, when you sit down, what are you going to do? Do you make a recommendation? Or do you actually dismiss and inform the head of the institution? It depends on what we've provided for in our, in our procedures. Then Mr. Timothy Shuruta says, what happens in a situation where an employee errors, investigations are instituted, and by the time officer separates with the company, who is supposed to charge this employee? Ideally, the charge should come from where the offense was committed from. And if the person has separated, and there's another officer in that line, we it would be best to use, there was just an investigation what was going on. But in some institutions, people have provided for such scenarios that where are you being raised? But the General practice is that where the offense was committed from, that's where it would be best that a charge is initiated. However, there's a flexibility depending on how you've also coined the rules. It's not tight, it's, uh, it's flexible. You may have to deal with uh, the situation. Mr. Stephen Scombe says, at what stage can an accused employee raise a conflict of interest on the disciplinary panel member or members? Is it before, during, or rather, or after the hearing? The best time to raise the conflict of interest is at a time is picked, which is immediately the, hearing, the introductions are done. Some institutions who are going to hear the case to the employee before the hearing, at that moment, if an employee is feels one of the members is conflicted who are sitting there. It is advisable the employee in their response to the invitation to the hearing that I note that you have indicated that uh, the ABC do attend my, uh, my hearing, but this member is conflicted and they can provide the details as you may request depending on your internal processes. If the employee is not aware of who is going to sit at that, uh, in that hearing, and they only see a person, it is best to raise an issue of conflict of interest. Immediate conflict of interest, which is raised afterwards, should be justified whether it has been established and prevented from raising issues to do with conflict of interest. If they can justify that they became aware of the conflict after the hearing, then they can still raise issues of conflict of interest. Anonymous sender says, how do you handle a situation where an employee supervisor is not on shift to charge an employee, could be sick or on leave? If the procedure requires immediate raising of a charge another person can be asked to raise a charge as in case but in such scenarios where raising of a charge is supposed to be done almost immediate i know of some industries where if an offense is committed in a particular shift 
a charge must be raised within that shift. Whoever is a supervisor in that shift must be asked to raise the charge. It should be somebody who's been left to be in charge. That's a person who can raise a charge. However, if there's a way, it's best to wait for a substantive office holder to do that. Can the disciplinary hearing go on without a charging officer? Yes or no? It will go ahead if the written submissions are sufficient to represent the charging officer in his or her absence. Where there is need for a charging officer to defend his submissions or to answer to the questions that are arising, the clarifications that are required from the committee and the charged employee, it is best that a charge of justice we were discussing allow a certain, certain facts, say, where you are making a submission like ABC, for argument's sake, somebody say, no, you are charged for absence, and then the, the charged employee says, I got permission from the supervisor and I sent a message to him or to her, and then he's disputing, he raises a charge. It would be necessary that the charging of to be present and allow an employee to the committee should be there to a certain where on the balance of probability who is giving a factual presentation to answer your question it is best and it will help you as a natural practitioner that a charging officer should be there doesn't matter who whether it's a ceo if that's a charging officer it's best to invite a charging officer and attend to all the clarification that to be coming through. The next question says, can the disciplinary proceeding? Uh, this question, I'll leave it to secretariat, but in practice, I don't know when you say somebody is not best. Is that person an employee of the institution? And how do you hear the cases? Is the person into Zambia? Does a person do the hearing? hearings? The way we are actually interacting institution, you may not have any limitations saying, no, oh, this person is outside Zambia. It's only a test of do they understand what is happening in Zambia? Do they understand the operations of your institution for them to ascertain whether that offense was committed and how well do they appreciate the procedures, the disciplinary procedures in, in that particular institution, how uh, they trained. That's what, uh, that's what I would submit. Uh, Secretariat, that was the last question. Just another comment, apologies, which was coming from Mr. Ezekiel Moyo at uh, uh, 1456 that I was, I couldn't, he couldn't hear me, but I hope people managed to pick uh, some things as I was explaining. But I just, the way I indicated, I will be sharing the cases. Uh, but those who are able to write, I said the first case you can read is Super Bets, Sports Betting versus Batuke Kadimukwa, Zambia Electricity Supply Corporation Limited versus David Luas Miambango, the Attorney General, Professional uh, Health and Safety Institute versus Luvinda Chainda. These are the cases. I've seen another case, another question from Novice Kanda. Can you dismiss an employee based on his or her uh, evidence? It's a bit tricky as to whether we can dismiss or not. Uh, there's some debate out there. Uh, when I, I pick the case, I'll, I'll, I'll share it as to what constitutes hearing. There's a case which says hearing does not entail coming to be heard and sit before a panel. It's even written submission could amount to being afforded an opportunity to be heard. So some institutions have gone ahead to dismiss or make a decision based on the exculpation of an employee. Because in that case, it's taken that the employee has uh, given the service a colleagues 
and looking at how our employment code now sits under section 52 with regards to the right to be heard and looking at the recent court decisions on defining the right to be heard it seems we are drifting to the requirement for a physical discussion before a tribunal rather than concentrating on the written evidence which has been submitted that's the issue on whether you can proceed it would be very dangerous for you to proceed on written evidence of the charged employee the best would be you just constitute um, uh, a, a tribunal and then so that it's it, it's clear who sat down to review and came up with that decision that is the last question uh Mr. Kola Lamrenga, unless if there are other questions, but I have, I, I should think I've exhausted. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hanakoma. Yes. I think, I think you have done justice to, to a topic and uh, as a council, indeed we are looking forward. Yes, uh, what I was saying is that I think we are we are pleased, uh, Mr. Anakoma, that you have really done justice to, to the topic. And uh, we just wish to apologize for those who wanted to ask questions, uh, of course, through, uh, of course, those who, who raised up their hands, but uh, luckily, that most of you, of course, you sent through, uh, of course, your the, 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 the text. And uh, Mr. Hanakoma, he has done justice to such uh, questions. Once again, we are very grateful and thank you for, I think, for your time, and especially our colleagues, the, the uh, I think, the, the fellow uh, practitioners. And of course, in our midst, we have the vice president, Mr. Clement Chipungu, uh, who, who is sitting in uh, the uh, in the office of the Zambia Institute of Human Resource uh, Management President? Uh, may I take this opportunity maybe to uh, request him to say one or two things as uh, we are going to wind up, uh, of course, uh, this presentation. I have been your host. Uh, Innocent Mulenga Korala, Fellow Zambia Institute of Human Resource, and of course, your Honorary Secretary, uh, Vice President, Mr. Clement Chipungusa. Hi, good afternoon, fellow practitioners. Indeed, today it was a very, it was an encouraging day. It was a good day for us today. Let me start with HS. That was a very good, uh, you've moderated very nice HS and we really appreciate for that. May I also acknowledge our counselor present there, Madam Helen, to the speaker. I call Mr. Stanford, uh, you've got authority in this discussion and we really appreciate some of us who've been following you and I hope and trust that colleagues have um, gotten a lot of things. Uh, the message which was presented, the topic, it was very good, captivating, and it's quite trending in, uh, in our profession. So we we'll definitely call upon you. Colleagues, today's topic, it was one of the good ones. Can an employer replace the charging officer and reconstitute the disciplinary committee? He did justice on that. I hope and trust you've learned a lot. You can reach us to the secretariat in order for you to get this recording or reach out to our website or social media. You can able to get this recording. I also further want to encourage the speaker, the village boy, Mr. Stanford, that uh, please, most of these cases which you have, send it in order for our colleagues to, to uh, to go through these cases that are very, very important. The attendance was very good. We started, we hit at the note of 176. Now we have uh, 
we have 99. So we really appreciate for the members who came forth and to listen to this uh, topic today. To the members, as as a council, we will endeavor to bring this webinar every month. And as we promise, on behalf of the president and the council, we are there to save you. We are there to support this profession, which is a noble cause. When you look at one of the function of our institute is to advance the HR management and promote its interest. And again, we would make sure that we want to provide continuous professional development within our practice. We do not want to hear that uh, when you are conducting disciplinary hearing, one of employees have beaten our HR. No. So it's imperative that we get to know this topic. We get to know the proceedings. We need to understand in and out on the policies governing disciplinary committee. And yeah, then the, lastly, colleagues, I want to also to encourage most of you who feel that they've got a burning topics, please reach out to the secretariats or our HS there. If you want to encourage and teach your colleagues and share HR practices in this country, how you are doing it in your profession. You're welcome to start. To conclude, HS, and dear colleagues, we are having next month, we are having an independence bride. Please take it and mark it in your calendar. We would want to associate with you. We'd want to see you uh, meet and greet the council, we had a lot of people there would also want most of you to come and participate. And next month as well is one of the most important months for us. We've got a convention in Livingston. To these colleagues, please continue getting in touch with us. HS, over to you. And thank you very much for moderating this discussion today. The speaker, thank you very much once again on behalf of the president and the council. Enjoy the rest of the evening or this afternoon. Thank, Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Maybe. I really appreciate uh, Vice uh, President. Uh, I've shared the case for the cases. I don't know if we're able to view them. Am I audible? Mr. Indeed you are, though of course you are breaking, but you're audible. Pungo. Okay, I've shared the cases. I don't know if we are able to view them. And uh, for some of those cases, uh, these are cases that we've discussed and uh, provided a bit of guidance on what they mean. Those who'd be interested for further reading, you can follow our page, this research corner, our Facebook page. You'll find a number of those uh, cases are summarized. Thank you so much. We are greatly humbled uh, to everyone uh, since the vice president and Minister Anakoma, they have uh, concluded and uh, sum up everything. We just want to say thank you and thank you once again for my fellow Sabbath keepers. Welcome to uh, the Sabbath uh, as we are looking forward for tomorrow's worship. Have a blessed uh, weekend to all of us. So, my children.